Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, discussion. I'm Taylor Bice with Porter, Assistant Curator at the California African American Museum. And I just want to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's uh, panel discussion, Deeds Not Words, History and the Making of Black Women's Clubs in California. Uh, again, I'm just so excited to be here with all of you. Thank you uh, all so much for joining in today. And just to give a, a brief introduction about tonight's discussion, uh, Black women in California have been making their mark in philanthropy, civic life, and culture since the 19th century. Uh, they've been campaigning for the right to vote, supporting African-American artists, and contributing to social justice. Tonight, our panel is moderated by history curator Susan D. Anderson with Dorothy Lazard, head librarian of the History Center at the Oakland Public Library, discussing the Fannie Jackson Coppin Club of Oakland. We also have Barbara Taylor, vice president of the League of Allied Arts in Los Angeles. Uh, we also have uh, um, Yvette Porter Moore, genealogist and historian of the San Diego Women's Civic League. Uh, and tonight we, they will be all examining the past and present of women's clubs in the state. Uh, and again, this is in presented in junction with uh, uh, rites and rituals, the making of African-American debutante culture, uh, which is currently on view at the California African-American Museum uh, which investigates the origins of women's social organizations uh, and the ways in which they've supported young Black women's participation in vital and sometimes understated race work um, within the exhibition. We're specifically looking at African-American debutante culture, but really finding that its foundations are within the development of women's clubs within the late 1800s, early 1900s. And we're today we're gonna be exploring those developments here in California. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists. Again, we have Dorothy Lazard, uh, and she is the head librarian of the Oakland History Center, uh, a research unit of the Oakland Public Library that maintains collections that tell, uh, that tell of the social, political, economic, demographic, and artistic development of the East Bay. Uh, besides providing quality uh, reference services, mounting exhibition and writing blogs on local history, Dorothy hosts a popular local history series each fall that recently went online uh, as a mini series of the Check Yourself podcast. She holds a master's degree in library and information studies from UC Ber uh, Berkeley and a master of fine arts in creative nonfiction from Gosher College in Baltimore, Maryland. Her writing appears regularly in the Oakland Heritage Alliance News and has been published in several anthologies, including the Public Library, a uh, photographic essay, uh, and Oakland Noir. Barbara Taylor Mason, uh, sorry, Barbara Mason Taylor is a native of Los Angeles. She's also a panelist uh, with us today. Um, and she has worked with the state of California uh, and working in management position and retired after 30 years of service. In 1998, she joined the League of Allied Arts Corp, one of the oldest arts organizations in the state of California, where she has served as president for four years and currently holding the position of VP Chair of Development and Community Outreach. Taylor attended UCLA majoring in psychology and attended USC to receive certification, uh, certifications in business and public relations. Yeah, they are on. Uh, and then we also have Yep Yvette Porter Moore, uh, who is a professional genealogist and public historian with over 30 years of experience in researching her own family history. She is currently researching the history of the Black community in San Diego and conducting interviews to personalize these stories. Porter Moore is uh, the founder and CEO of Root Digger Genealogy Research Services, which focuses on air research, uh, genealogy research, developing family trees, and publishing family histories. 
She has appeared on KGTV and Channel 8 News during Black History Month and was a guest researcher on the Travel Channel, appearing in uh, Dead Files. Porter Moore holds an AA degree in cross-cultural studies, a BA in human development, a paralegal certificate from USD, and genealogical research certificate from Boston University, and the Midwestern African American Genealogy Institute. And then we also, uh, joining us, we have uh, Carolyn Elzey, who was born in New Orleans, moved to San Jose in 1963 to continue her education at San Jose State uh, University. She is the mother of two, a grandmother of three, and a great-grandmother of two. She is a member of the Garden City Women's Club uh, San Jose for over 45 years and has served in various capacities in the organization. Uh, and again, I just want to say thank you all ladies for joining our discussion tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you uh, are doing in your respective organizations and really be able to see the connection, um, you know, with women's clubs across California, how they worked together, whether it be singular in their own communities or again across the state of California. And now I'd like to turn it over to history curator Susan D. Anderson, who will moderate this discussion. Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Taylor. Uh, before we move on, um, I would love to hear from you as the curator of the exhibit rites and rituals, if you have any kind of favorite stories or historical events or incidents that stand out to you that kind of represent the show. Oh, I think one of my favorite stories, uh, I didn't necessarily include it within the exhibition, but it was uh, something interesting that I found during my research. Um, when I was looking for information about, um, uh, you know, some of the women's clubs and different people and seeing their migrate, you know, their patterns and travel. Um, one was Pearl Hines Roberts. Oh yes. Yeah, and she was very active uh, with the NAACP. And I think it was a conference in Chicago sometime in the 1930s where Dr. Veda Somerville was hosting a, a baby judging contest, like who has the cutest baby. And, and Pearl was one of the people who submitted her, her newborn child with Frederick Roberts. Uh, and she won, she won, she, the cutest baby. I think she won like a hundred dollars at the time. And I just thought that was really interesting uh, just to see how there are different parts yeah. of California, how they went and they were traveling to another state, another city, and they still had their stories kind of intertwined for that one moment and how it was captured in the California Eagle. I thought that was a really interesting moment. And from there, I just got really into how black newspapers were just covering travel at the time, how, uh, you know, just capturing social clubs. So even if it was um, a bridge club, <laughs> the bridge club gathered at, you know, Barbara Taylor's home. She served a beautiful lemonade with mint inside and the guests uh, and all the guests that were attending. And I kind of wish that they would still do that now, but I think it would be too much. There's too many, <laughs> there's too, there's too many people, but it was really interesting to be able to track those movements in that kind of way. And I felt a lot more closer to these women. Absolutely. And yeah. these two figures that you mentioned are actually of great historical significance. Uh, Pearl Hines Roberts, first of all, her father, was one of the wealthiest landowners during the 19th century in Tulare County and owned a large ranch. He owned orchards and eventually bought a home in Oakland, which is where Pearl spent most of her teenage years and young adulthood. And in a, traveling to Los Angeles, she met Fred Roberts, 
who was publishing a newspaper, The New Age, and came from the Roberts, A.J. Roberts Mortuary family. And for those who don't know, uh, Frederick Roberts, her husband, became the first African-American elected to the state legislature in 1919. The mm -hmm. same is true for Mrs. Somerville. Um, she was the first African-American woman in uh, at least Los Angeles, possibly California, to practice, to earn her degree in practice as a dentist. And she and her husband opened what is now the famous Dunbar Hotel on Central Avenue. So those uh, it, it, people were keeping track of, of their own in those newspaper stories. Well, I am going to um, thank Taylor so much and move along and, and let people know that I'm the history curator at the California African American Museum and our mission is to research, collect, preserve and interpret for public enrichment, the history, art and culture of African Americans with an emphasis on California and the West. And before I uh, plunge into my presentation, I wanna ask our distinguished guests, how is everybody doing? Everybody Great. okay? Yeah. Doing pretty well. All I'm right. Good. Really good. good. We're so pleased to have you and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the long, little-known history of Black women's clubs in California. And as you heard, we have representation from Oakland, San Jose, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And uh, I'm going to mention that we actually tried to identify a participant from the Sacramento Area Women's Civic Improvement Club, but we were unable to. If there's anybody in the audience uh, in Sacramento, I'm inviting you to reach out to me and let me know where those folks are. Uh, also, um, I wanna point out that in our audience, uh, we're being joined by representatives of at least two other clubs. Um, I have been in touch with Sue Kaplan for the Monday Morning Club which was founded in Venice in 1923. And also, I believe we're being joined by Anise Harkey with the Philo Mathian Charity Club Incorporated that was founded in Santa Monica in 1921, over a hundred years ago this November. So as you heard from um, my colleague, Taylor Blythewood Porter, this program's being presented in association with the CAM exhibit that you just heard about, Rites and Rituals, the Making of African-American Debutante Culture. It's on view at CAM right now and we are open. So we wanna invite you to come visit. And what we're gonna do is eventually in a few minutes go round robin in our discussion with our wonderful panelists. Um, but right now, what I'm gonna do is start a little slideshow um, to provide a little historical background on black women's clubs and social activism in California. So I want everybody just to bear with me while we get it up on the screen. Hello. Hmm. I'm going to try that again because I didn't see it. Well, I'm not sure what happened. I've got two show slide shows here and mine isn't showing now so be patient with me and see if I can get it up on the screen
Susan, there's a tip in the chat. Uh-huh. What um, is it? It's at the end of the slideshow. Start from the beginning. Hit the back button on your slides. Oh, okay. That's helpful. So hit the back button. On your slides, to I guess, to get to the top of the slideshow. Oh, here it is. Well, it took a little time, but there we are, right? Everybody can see that, huh? Yes. yes. Thank you so much for being patient. So the Black Women's Club movement in California represents almost 200 years of activism in the state. And these clubs were really multi-purpose. <laughs> Um, almost all of them were involved in philanthropy and the women were utilized, not like the nonprofit world of today. They were using their own money um, uh, as philanthropists. They were involved in social service, providing uh, services for people who are impoverished, for orphans. Um, and they were definitely involved in civic work. And I want to point out that in 1912, the Crisis Magazine pointed out in an article that the California women's clubs were singularly uh, active compared to the rest of the country. So starting during the gold rush, African-American women fulfilled what historian Shirley Ann Wilson Moore called a tradition of service in their churches. And they began organizing club activities as early as 1859 with the Ladies Club in Placerville in El Dorado County. I was able to find this image uh, from the library at uh, John Marshall um, Gold Discovery Park uh, of a woman, her portrait in El Dorado County or from a little later than that time. And in the 1860s in California, we saw the founding of San Francisco's Ladies Benevolent Society and Ladies Pacific Accommodating and Benevolent Society in 1861. The first uh, chapter of the Eastern Star, um, which is, you know, is the female auxiliary to the Masons in California was started in um, Sacramento. And in Oakland in 1884, the household of Ruth and the Ladies Be Beneficial Society were established. It was really in the early 20th century when African-American women began accelerating their organizing in that first decade and the catalyst was the establishment of the California State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Now the State Federation was founded 10 years after the National Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. That was founded in a national meeting in Washington DC in 1896. 10 years later, the dozens of clubs in the state of California came together to form the State Federation we're looking at an image that was uh, a, from a photograph taken of the statewide meeting held in Oakland. And this was in 1915. The motto of the State Federation, uh, and this is where we got the title from our pro for our program. The motto of the State Federation was deeds, not words. And it reflected the women's pragmatism, their focus on getting things done. And it also represented their feminism. This was the slogan of suffragist Alice Paul, who was the founder of the National Women's Party. And I'm going to give a couple of examples before wrapping this up and moving on to our panel. A couple of examples of early 20th century black women who were club women. These two women that I'm gonna mention were representative 
of hundreds of women across the state. When you look at the activity of clubs, they were in every part of California, in counties in the far north, in the Bay Area, many of them in the Central Valley, in San Gabriel Valley, Pasadena, Los Angeles, San Diego area. They were scattered throughout the state. Um, and these were women who contributed to the social welfare of their communities. They, before the passage of um, the amendment that uh, 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 had uh, uh, gave women access to the vote in California in 1911, they rallied male voters on behalf of women's suffrage. And I just wanna mention briefly that the black male vote was overwhelmingly in favor of women's suffrage. And these women also importantly supported the arts and culture, especially among their own people in California. This you're seeing on the screen is an ad uh, for a suffrage meeting uh, that was being uh, put together by leaders in the Oakland area. So one of the women, club women that I'd like to mention is Georgia Ann Robinson in Los Angeles. She was, uh, according to the Crisis Magazine, um, <clears throat> in, when she was appointed in 1917, she was the first uh, African-American policewoman in the United States. She was appointed to the Los Angeles Police Department in 1917. Interestingly, LAPD uh, was also possibly the first police department to hire African-American men in the uh, 1880s and 90s. Um, Georgia Ann Robinson was an extraordinary activist. She was a founder of the Los Angeles branch of the NAACP in 1912. She worked with community leaders to desegregate schools and beaches. And as a suffragist, as she put it, she campaigned for women's votes before she was old enough to vote herself. Mm -hmm. The other woman who I would like to mention before moving along is Hetty Tillman. She uh, lived in Oakland and she became, she was very active in the, uh, the State Federation of Colored Women's Club serving as president and, and other offices. Um, she helped found the Phyllis Wheatley Club she served on the board of the Home for Aged and Infirm Colored People. She was president of the Fannie Wall Children's Home and Day Nursery in the early 20s in the Bay Area. She ran the Bay Area branch of the NAACP. And after she helped as a suffragist, women gained the vote in the state of California. She was involved in the League of Women Voters. So what I'd like to do is move along to our next presenter, uh, Dorothy Lazard, who is the head librarian of the Oakland History Center in the Oakland Public Library. And welcome, Dorothy. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for having me. Thanks for welcoming me to participate in this panel. I'm very excited and it was uh, great to do prepare for this to learn more about this uh, area of our history because I didn't I only knew a little bit about women's clubs um, through various programs and events that I've sponsored over the years but it was really great to have an opportunity to dig a little deeper so thank you for this opportunity. Well as you know black women have been working collaboratively to improve um, should I go the, ahead and share the screen? Uh, sure, you can start. To improve the lives of our families and our larger communities long before there were any formal or incorporated women's clubs um, established. So as, as Susan mentioned, right after uh, slavery, women were coming together to create clubs to aid their communities and aid uh, their political fortunes as well. 
the women's club movement really took off during the progressive era, which was a roughly a period 1890s through the 1910s. And that's where we see just a real blossoming of these organizations in which they were working, women were working toward social activism and political reform. And, um, but before I talk about the Fanny Jackson Coppin Club, which I've been commissioned here to talk about, I want to talk about the club's namesake. She was born into slavery in 1837, and her freedom was bought by an aunt. She became educated in Pennsylvania, attended the Rhode Island School, thank you, uh, attended the Rhode Island uh, State Normal School and uh, went on to be, uh, get an education at Oberlin College in Ohio, where she organized reading classes for freedmen during her senior year. She became a respected teacher and a vocal advocate for women's higher education. Uh, she established an industrial school for African-Americans in 1879 in Cheney, Pennsylvania. And she is noted to be the first black principal of a school in the United States. She uh, went to South Africa with her husband, the AME uh, minister, Levi Coppin, um, and stayed there for five years uh, doing missionary work. Uh, returned to America in 1907 and died in 1913. Coppin State University in Baltimore is named for her. Now, that's just a real brief snapshot of this really fascinating woman who deserves her own program. Um, this is a picture that you're seeing now is a picture around the time that she came to visit. The women's club movement that was named, the women's club that was named for her was Oakland's first black club of, its, of that kind. Uh, it was founded June 30th, 1899 by members of the Beth Eaton Baptist Church. Its 12 charter members met at the home of Mrs. C.J. Goldstone, who served as the club's first president. Now the club was originally called the Cosmos Club. It served as kind of a prototype for the states, other states' women's clubs. And as such, it was referred to as the Mother Club. According to Dolores Nason McBroom, who wrote in her book, Parallel Communities, African-Americans in California's East Bay, 1850 to 1863, Fanny Jackson Coppin visited Oakland in 1899. The club women there were of the Cosmos Club were so impressed with her and her accomplishments that they wanted to honor her by renaming their club uh, after her in 1906. Members met at various, um, yeah, here's a picture of the women gathered. This was um, years after it was uh, founded. And we can stop the slides now for a minute, Susan, thank you. Um, members met at various uh, members' homes on the first and third Tuesday afternoons each month. The club's motto, not failure, but low aim is the crime. The club aimed to develop the educational and cultural life of community members for the uplift of the community, but also to work against the barriers of race discrimination and sexism. Their first philanthropic act was to raise funds to finance a young man's tuition to Tuskegee Institute. They also hosted and housed uh, prominent African-American visitors, musical events, literary talks. They developed fundraisers to aid heart and polio research. They supported guide dogs for the blind, held commemorative tree plantings on Arbor Day in honor of black role models like Crispus Attucks. In 1913, the, uh, the Northern California Federation of Women's Club organized and incorporated the Fanny Jackson Coppin Club and other, uh, other clubs, other local clubs like the Women's Art and Industrial Club and the Elmhurst Improvement Club into its network. In 1916, the Coppin Club had 25 members. Meetings had revolving hosts and revolving themes. 
such as Negro history or forestry. And it shows the diversity of this group and the interest uh, that they shared. Um, they focused, they had thematic meetings on motherhood, on the new year and California history. Their activities were regularly chronicled in Delilah Beasley's activities among Negro, Negroes column. Uh, you can advance the, to the next slide, Susan, thank you. So here's, uh, as Susan mentioned, Hetty Tillman. On the left, we see Hetty Tillman, who, as Susan mentioned, uh, was a very accomplished woman, very involved in uh, a variety of both political and social things. And the woman next to her is, was a long time, long term uh, member of the Coppin Club, Lydia Flood Jackson, who was at the club's um, 62nd anniversary. Uh, so uh, she was a very much, uh, she was a member for 42 years. She lived to be 101. She's distinguished as she was a businesswoman uh, investing in real estate as her father before her. Her mother um, was an, a California educator, also deserving of her own program. Uh, but these women were um, also Hetty Tillman, I wanna say, created uh, daycare centers and youth clubs in Oakland, as well as all the other accomplishments that Susan shared with you earlier. Uh, the members also worked to support the Home for the Aged and Infirm Colored People, which was founded in Oakland in 1897, and the construction on it was completed in 1899. That home was California's first for Black seniors. So they're working, uh, you know, creating kindergartens and daycares and serving the elderly uh, population. So I think that's very commendable. Um, and as I've tried to point out, they were invested in lots and lots of activities. Uh, they, these members helped found the Linden Street YWCA. Um, and here's some, uh, let's go and look at some more members. This is Julia Shorey and her family. She was married to Captain William Shorey, who was a, a called the Black Ahab, he was a sea captain. She was also involved in the home for uh, aged and infirm colored people. Next slide. And this is Melba Stafford, one of the charter members of the Coppin Club, among other things. And Delilah Beasley, for, certainly, she celebrated and, and broadcast news about the, the various women's club, including the Coppin Club uh, in her column, Activities Among Negroes. And next slide. So the, she was really, uh, from 1915 to her death in 1934, Delilah Beasley covered uh, uh, a lot of activities of the club women. Uh, she was a member of the Coppin Club herself and uh, was very invested in both well, political and social and artistic reporting about uh, the African-American community. Her book, ne Negro Trailblazers of California, as I say there in the caption, is still in print. Um, it is um, an amazing book that stands the test of time as far as capturing early African-American history going back many centuries, not just from the gold rush forward, but many centuries of African-American uh, life and progress in California. Next slide. Um, what else do I wanna tell you? Um, the members collaborated as was mentioned by Susan with other local uh, organizations like the Big Brothers the Fannie Wall uh, Home, which was an orphanage, and organizations working for women's suffrage. Over 1,500 uh, Black women convened July 31st to August 5th, 1926, uh, here in Oakland to discuss issues like social work, educational progress, and more active participation in civic life. And these were very robust meetings of women uh, here you see some um, members of the Linden Street Y 
And the Linden Street Y was really terrific in that it both provided housing, job training, um, job um, listings and so forth for the community, as well as uh, cultural events of all kinds for various ages of people. Um, what's on the next slide? This next slide is one that Susan uh, shared with you earlier. Um, and I thought it was really interesting as I was looking through some of the membership rosters uh, that they have at the African American Museum and uh, Library here in Oakland that uh, most of the members lived in North and West Oakland and South Berkeley. I just thought that was an interesting discovery uh, because I thought it would be more um, the, that the Coppin Club would have more members around the entirety of the city. Um, the Crisis Magazine described the, uh, the women's social activism as exhibited by the clubs as a divine fire. And I find that that is uh, a terrific way to um, kind of honor and point out how much work that what they've done for African-American communities here in the East Bay. Just to give you an idea of their importance, I just want to give you a sense of the population and how much it grew and how much impact these club women would have had here in Oakland. In 1890, the black population in Oakland was 644. By 1910, it was 3,055. 20 years later in 1930, it was 7,503. So the population every 20 years is exploding here in Oakland. And so they must have had a tremendous amount of uh, impact um, uh, providing really great services to uh, and, and role modeling for the community. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um... Yeah, the population growth really picked up after the San Francisco earthquake and a lot of people left the city, left San Francisco and moved to Oakland and other places. And that was true for black people too. Mm -hmm. And after the earthquake, Oakland in the Bay Area, Oakland had the largest black population. It was no longer yeah. in San Francisco. And it held that role until the 19 teens, the te after 1910, the, the population boom in Los Angeles started bringing uh, African Americans in droves to Southern California and LA became kind of the population, the big population center um, uh, in the state. And it's sort of been that way ever since. I'm so glad you brought Delilah Beasley into the conversation. She belongs to all of us. Yes. If there's anybody in the audience who doesn't know who she is, um, one of the things I want to say about her is that her book that Dorothy mentioned, The Negro Trailblazers of California, is a foundational text. Yes. I have it right next to me yes. now. Um, when I'm doing research on my book on any project, she is my first reference uh, for that early history. Um, and it's a book that anybody who's interested in African American history in California, you, it can't, you cannot do without it. And also a characteristic is that it's statewide. I mean, I'm sure if yes. that you found this too, that although she was based in Oakland, she wrote about the whole state and she traveled the whole state. One of the things I love about the book is the foreword was written by Charlotta Bass, mm -hmm. the editor of the California Eagle, her sister, her sister journalist. Yeah, I want yeah, to say- It's amazing, it's an amazing book. It, it is foundational. Yeah, it yeah is found I want to say that, um, Without her, um, just knowing who she is, um, I found her and I was just thrilled because it, it gave me 
the idea that I can do it too, considering all the struggles that she went through to um, get this book um, published or actually to do the research. Um, in her honor, I, I went to the cemetery and, and visited her, um, you know, where she hmm. was, is resting. And um, I just know that in order for me to do this work that I want to do, I need to, um, you know, look at what she's already done. And I think all of us together could actually um, do a wonderful um, next 100 years, you know, because it, it, her book was published in 1920 or 1919. And um, well, what happened after that? And right. I just think that that may be something that we all could come together and put together. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank that you. Well, uh, I just want to say as the librarian on staff here <laughs> on the panel, um, you can find, for those of you listening in, you can find a copy of the Delilah Beasley book, uh, Negro Trailblazers of California on the Internet Archive, oh. archive.org. And you can read the book in its entirety if your eyes can stand it. Uh, yeah, so it is available. It's kind of hard to find a hard copy of it, um, but they're still around and they are still selling the book. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, Barbara Mason Taylor, Taylor, she is the vice president of the League of Allied Arts in Los Angeles. And we are gonna hear from Barbara she, I'm really looking forward to her narrative about the league's history. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about that, that club. I too thank you, Susan, for inviting me. And I can say that now, 82 years old, the League of Allied Arts was established in 1939. This is when poet and playwright Langston Hughes came to Los Angeles to present his play don't you want to be free? However, in 1939, there was no black theaters for him to do this. Fortunately, he had two very close friends that were art advocates that helped him, number one, to find a place and to pack the house. And they did that for, they packed the house for two weeks. With, performances every night. And he was so happy that they did this. They went down the street from the, well, let me just say this. When Langston Hughes came to town, he stayed at the famous Dunbar Hotel. So they wanted to uh, find a place that was close to where he was staying. So they, this is on Central Avenue. And they went down the street, found a storefront and turned it into a theater. And again, like I said, they packed the house every night. And, um, and actually the only reason it closed down is because the place that they got, they, the police department and the fire department considered it to be a fire hazard. Of course, they didn't like Langston Hughes anyway because they thought he was a, he was a communist. And so, they were happy to close this down and, and they did. But he was ever so grateful for the work that these two ladies have done, had done that they went back to the Dunbar Hotel, sat down and had coffee. And he said, you know what? I am so thrilled about the work that you have done that I think that you should start an organization and do this and keep the arts central in LA, and which is our motto. So our motto now is keeping the arts central in LA. Um, with, with that being said, um, the organization continued to function. And actually the League of Allied Arts was incorporated as a nonprofit organization uh, on December 12th, 19, 74. At that time, they realized that they needed to expand, not only uh, work with the theater, but all forms of the arts. 
So these two women decided that they were going to um, continue their work and start giving scholarships to all forms of the arts for high school students and first year college. And we're continuing to do that. Um, uh, with carrying on our program, we also decided that we were going to sponsor um, exhibits and showcase our kids, the ones that we have given scholarships to. So what we do is we, we showcase this, the kids and we also have um, um, give our scholarships. And our scholarships are not shabby. <laughs> we give out pretty good scholarships, actually. And uh, we try to give out at least six scholarships every two years. And the way we get the money is when we have fundraisers. And so we have um, a lot of fundraisers and we also try to go out and get um, money from corporates and foundations in order to sustain what we do. Um, um, among some of our sponsors in poetry and jazz, um, the late Langston Hughes and Buddy Collette had a, um, a concert where um, Langston Hughes would um, recite his poetry and Buddy Collette would play, which was a fabulous, um, from what I understand, because I wasn't, I wasn't around with it, but what I understand it was a, a fabulous uh, outing for, for, for the league to do. Um, you know, right now we are still working really hard with our kids. Um, we enjoy, at least I enjoy, we all enjoy doing exactly what we do. And that is giving scholarships out. And this is what we do right now and showcasing our kids. Um, with that being said, um, I think, well, I can also say that we have all of our, I can go on and on and on if you really want me to, Susan, because well, I mean, you know, our history is so rich, it's unbelievable. It's, it I, don't is, know if we, I don't know if we actually have the time for me to do it, but I'll do as much as you want me to do. Well, what I wanted you to do is you have mentioned the two founders, but you, I would love for you to tell us who they were. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, actually, one of the founders was uh, Dorothy Bina Johnson. And uh, she was also a poet and educator. Um, Juanita Miller, who was um, a social worker, and she was married to Lauren Miller, who was an attorney and an advocate of the arts and, and a, very a very close friend. One of dear, dear friend, lifelong friends of friend Langston of Hughes. Hughes. Right. Very when close Langston friend. Hughes spent a lot of time in California. People are not aware of that. Yeah. And uh, he spent time in Hollywood as a script doctor on many films during the 30s and 40s. He wrote several of his books, uh, Staying in a Friend's Home in Carmel by the mm -hmm. Sea. And right. he was in Los Angeles on a regular basis, visiting with his friends, the Millers, staying in the home of, of Lauren Miller and Josephine Miller, who lived in Silver Lake. Right. Well, actually, um, also there was a school named after uh, Dorothy Vina Johnson um, because of her, and in her own right, she wrote uh, a poem. So oh, she yes. wrote. She was she a did. well published poet, and she and yes. Langston Hughes knew each other from poetry right. circles. One of the things we agreed to talk about, Barbara. Uh -huh. was, and what I think about in thinking about all the women's clubs um, before we move on um, to our next speaker is um, the importance of the archives uh, in being able to tell these stories. Uh, Dorothy mentioned the collections at the African-American Museum and Library at Oakland. 
And I'm really pleased that you and I and the membership of the league were able to work together several years ago to gather and preserve the league's archive, right. um, which is in UCLA library now and accessible. And the stories that you are telling about Langston Hughes, about the theater performances, the jazz, and poetry, they're documented in the archive. Not only that, Susan, is the fact that the, the, the letters between Lauren Miller and uh, Langston Hughes are also housed at the Huntington Library in Pasadena. Yeah, remember we did that program to celebrate did, that? <laughs> right, right. And you were on the board then. <laughs> when so, we you did know, that. Uh, the, there, we can, we're going to be able to talk more in the questions, but, I, and okay. I hope you don't mind, I'd like to move on to our next panelist. Sure. Okay. Thank no you problem. so much. You're certainly um, welcome. It, and it's just so important because the work that these women have done covers the gamut, including the arts and culture. Right. Our next guest is Mrs. Elsie. You are looking fabulous, Mrs. Elsie. If you don't mind me making that remark, I'm so glad you joined us. And um, Mrs. Elsie, Carolyn Elsie is vice president of the San Jose Garden City Women's Club. And would you please share some of the club's history with us? I most certainly will. And I just want to say thank you so much, Susan, for um, allowing us the privilege of participating on this program. Uh, Garden City Women's Club was organized by Elizabeth Boyer, who came to San Jose from Detroit, Michigan in 1898. She organized our club in 1908. The Garden City Women's Club has been uh, active during this entire period with the exception of a portion of World War II. We have not been able to find any records for that period. But other than that, we have been. Now she came to San Jose from Detroit, Michigan with her husband, Dr. Daniel Boyer. And Dr. Boyer owned a massage parlor in San Jose on First Street, 85 North First, I believe. They purchased a home here in San Jose at uh, 446 North 5th Street. And the home, believe it or not, is still standing. So uh, that uh, we, we passed there a number of times just to see it. Now, we do know that we have, I think it's Elizabeth Boyer, Marina Madden, Eliza Rankins, Maddie Berry, Anna V. McCall, Augusta Overton, Isabel Adams, and Ella Davis were some of the original members of the club. Um, we now we do a number of things with the Garden City Women's Club. We belong to the California State Association of Colored Women Clubs Incorporated. We're also a member of the Southwest region of the National Association of Colored Women Clubs. The Southwest region consists of actually eight states. Um, the states, I usually California, Arizona, Mexico, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, and also uh, Hawaii. Now, I don't know if we still have an active club in Hawaii, but I did meet some of our sisters in Hawaii when I was there on one of my visits. Um, now, our national association consists of clubs in every state of the union. And the reason we had the National Association, and you touched on a few things, uh, Susan, but um, in 1895, 
there was this young lady by the name of Florence Balgarni who wrote a letter to this uh, man by the name of James Jacks to ask for his assistance in uh, trying to combat, she belonged to the Anti-Lynching League. Oh so she wrote to him to try to combat, for his assistant to combat the lynching of our black brothers and sisters. Well, Jack wrote back to her saying that the Negroes in this country are wholly devoid of morality. He said, they know nothing of it except as they learn by being caught for flagrant violations of the law and punished thereof. He said, they consider it no disgrace, but rather an honor to be sent to prison and to wear striped clothes. The women are prostitutes and all are natural liars and thieves. Out of the 200 in this vicinity, he said, it is doubtful that there are a dozen virtuous women of that number who are not daily thieving from white people. Well, after that response, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin called all of these clubs together, all organizations that she knew of, to confer and to meet in Washington, D.C. This was in 1896, the following year after that letter from James Jacks. She called these ladies together to organize the National Association of Colored Women Club. And they had a, um, a set program. They knew what they wanted to talk about. They said, we need to talk over not only those things that are vital importance to us as women, but also the things that are of special interest to us as colored women. The training of our children, opening of our boys and girls that, so that they could be prepared for occupations. So this is why they formed the National Association of Colored Women Clubs. Yes, and um, I want to um, say that you're absolutely right about the history mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if you look at the formation of this movement uh, throughout its history, whether it's the uh, women in Oakland who, uh, built a home for aged and infirm colored mm -hmm. people. Um, one of the impetuses for that is because old, you know, old folks homes that were run and owned by white people did not take uh, black residents. <laughs> Just as Barbara mentioned yeah. that Langston Hughes was unable to find a white venue for his play in Los Angeles, so the a community had to come together to find a venue. We, there's no question that from the beginning, um, you know, this movement has been a, a partly a response uh, to racism and, and that, you know, we've been, this, this, it developed in the era of Jim Crow but as you can see from the lives of the women and their accomplishments, this was not their preoccupation. And um, also uh, they knew that they were not that much different from the people who they were serving. They knew that they were as, as threatened as the people that they were serving. What I wanna do is move on to Yvette I want to thank you so much, Mrs. Elsie, and I'm hoping that there will be questions for you about the work that the organization has done over the years in San Jose. Thank you so much. And I'd like to move on, if you wouldn't mind, to Yvette, who can um, talk to us about the Women's Civic League of San Diego. And after Yvette, we're going to take questions from the audience, so please write your questions in the Q&A and we, we're looking forward to engaging with the audience. So thank you, Yvette, looking forward to hearing from you. 
Yes, Thank um, I appreciate the invite to share um, th this evening. Um, I, at, at one point, I was interviewing a couple of individuals um, that I was interested in their history. And it just so happened that um, I was invited to share um, information and these individuals were a part or knew something about the um, the Negroes um, Civic League in San Diego. So um, I didn't realize that there was a lot that we needed to um, learn about the clubs, um, but it's an area where we, we need to do more research. I'm going to share my um, presentation. Okay, let's see. Okay, the San Diego Women's Civic League, Deeds Not Words. And it was interesting that the topic was Deeds Not Words. Um, when I was interviewing the um, nephew of Mrs. Rebecca Kraft, um, Cecil Stepp, um, in, in our conversation, he let me know that it was about deeds and not words. So I thought, wow, this must be one of the mottos of the um, women's civic leagues um, throughout California. Let's see. Okay, so here's a photo of Rebecca and John Kraft. Um, Rebecca Kraft was the founder of the San Diego Women's Civic League. She organized the league with 11 members in 1935. Um, there, um, I did find something else that said it was 1934. And this evening, um, I was told 1929. However, I think what happened with um, Mrs. Rebecca Kraft is that she founded various um, community centers within San Diego, um, such as the Logan Heights Young People's um, Community Center, Baptist Young People's Union, and, um, and she also um, met with other ladies at another time um, before then, and they must have had a different name. And um, at a later date, we will find out what um, the names of those clubs are. Um, Rebecca Kraft um, was from Versalius, um, Kentucky. And she was educated at the Kentucky Normal and Industrial Institute for Colored Persons, which is now Kentucky State University, which is a historically um, black university. She was trained as a teacher and she taught in Kentucky for many years. So when she moved to San Diego, um, she attempted to um, apply for a position as a school teacher, but was turned down because of her race. And mm -hmm. so from that point, she realized that she had an issue that um, she could fight for. And so around that time, um, she joined with um, 11 other ladies um, of this Women's Civic League, and um, they were located on Imperial Avenue at the time. Um, today they're located on at the um, on Clay Street in Southeast San Diego. Okay, so um, so the Negro Women's Civic Center is the most well-known group that she founded, as it created a lot of benefits for the community. Um, so she not only fought to um, have it, you know, to change the way that um, African Americans were hired into um, at the school level, but she also um, fought for the hiring practices of Blacks on the police force. Um, they also um, pushed for equality in. Um, in other arenas, and she was um, active on the San Diego um, PTA. Okay, and um, oh, I guess I need to turn the page. I'm sorry. Okay, 
here is a photo of um, the Women's Civic League. Um, and the, some of the individuals in this photo are friends. Uh, Mrs. Kraft is down here at the bottom sitting um, with the checkered um, outfit on. And the lady um, holding a purse all the way to the right, um, that's uh, Mrs. Van Lowe. And um, she was the first African-American woman to teach at the San Diego um, City Schools. Um, she was hired um, with the help of um, Mrs. Kraft and the Women's Civic League. Um, before then, there was a lady that was um, hired as a substitute teacher and that was the only African-American that they allowed um, to teach at the time, but she was not hired as a regular staff member. Oh, and, and the other thing is, um, like I said, um, there were a lot of social clubs and um, women's social clubs. And so this is one um, by Janice Groves Todd. Her mother is in this photo. And one of the clubs was um, the 12 Charm Social Club, but there were many. And as I was looking through newspapers, I came across those and, um, and then, um, let's see. And then um, al alongside, um, we have the AKAs and um, they have debutantes. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what year um, our San Diego chapter started, um, but this is um, 1970 um, debutantes, San Diego chapter. And then we have the 1969 um, San Diego chapter. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that um, there were many organizations and, um, and, and the women that were participants in the various organizations, um, you know, they, they, they actually, you know, served in some of the same ones. And um, so um, I don't know what to say about this, but um, I, I just wanna uh, figure out what the link is um, with that. Um, and that's another, another club is the links. They, um, you know, they want, they, the links was, I believe in San Diego was in 1945 and um, they, um, you know, it, it's, it's like a still like a coming out for um, young black men. And um, so a lot of the organizations pushed for um, young African-American women and men to um, be upstanding individuals in their community and to, um, you know, participate civically. Um, so, I mean, I, I know there's a lot that we can um, talk about. And so I wanted to, um, you know, see what kind of questions that we may have. But I do know that in San Diego, there is a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, when I um, spoke to um, Gloria Tyler Mallory, her mother was the, um, the last um, and the youngest member of that club, um, the Women's Civic League, but it um, hasn't been active since about 2000. And okay. so one of my questions is, how are we going to get that started? And right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you, Yvette, but thank you to all the panelists. And, um, you know, we're only able really to provide kind of abbreviated histories, but uh, we would like to give people in the audience a chance um, to get questions in. I don't know if I am moderating questions or what, um, let's see. I am, Alexandra, did you find questions? Let's see, I have one question here. Someone asked if they can come visit the CAM exhibition, Rites and Rituals. Yes, we mentioned that at the top of the um, program. Absolutely, the museum is open. 
Um, also, I see a question, how are black women clubs? Somebody also, Sue Kaplan asked if we'd have time for her to say a few words. We mentioned the Monday Women's Club of Oakwood in Venice, California. Um, how are black women's clubs making sure that they remain relevant in today's world? Uh, how about that as a question to Barbara, to Mrs. Elsey, um, especially they are, they are officers in their clubs and aware of the clubs that are active now. How, what, are, what are women's, black women's clubs being doing now to make sure they're relevant? Um, you know what, I, one of the things I'd like Barbara to do is talk about these um, scholarships that are given to high school, African-American high school seniors and college students who are artists. Right. And the League of Allied Arts has been doing that for decades now. In fact, some very well-known artists like uh, um, Misty Copeland, um, who's the first black prima ballerina in the American Ballet Theater, other people like that. Chris, he, Chris Bowers, who, who played, the, did the music score for one of the, uh, can't think of the name of the movie, but it, it was on the Oscars. Um, I'll think of it, but yeah, we have Chris Bowers as well. So the question of relevancy and uh, anything that you'd like to add, Mrs. Elsie, about how do you stay relevant today and how do these clubs stay relevant today? Well, there's a need for the club today. We all have a mutual purpose. One of the things that Garden City Women's Club is involved in every year, we give a senior prom every year along with the African American Community Services Agency, senior prom for our senior citizens, because many of them did not have an opportunity to attend their prom. Many of them didn't complete high school. So this gives them an opportunity to attend a prom. We also have members volunteering in various capacities in the community. We serve on advisory boards with the senior nutrition programs. We are members of the NAACP in Silicon Valley. We have members in our club that are members of the Lynx chapter. Uh, the Obama Boulevard Committee, we're in the process of naming a street for Obama, Obama Boulevard. So and we're trying to get former President Barack Obama to attend the naming and the uh, of the street once we get that off the ground. We're working Thank on you. that. Thank yes. you. Um, there's another question. Um, are there currently any clubs that focus on Black Lives Matter? And I don't know if our panelists can answer that, except that one of the things I would say as a historian is that Black Lives Matter is just the most recent iteration of a generations of a movement of a black freedom movement that is generations long that stems from the 18th century and i think that you know many of these leaders that we're talking about were asserting that black lives matter long before we have a movement that's associated with that phrase um, so, and the, the concept is, isn't a, a new concept itself in such an old movement. Um, let's see, I don't know if uh, Taylor Blythewood Porter is around, but there is a question um, about talking about, asking about the LA Lynx chapter and um, one of the things I want to mention is that if you are able to visit the exhibition 
uh, I think in a lot of ways, it's, it is an exploration of the LA Leaks chapter. That's one kind of, of uh, a view of what it, what it explores. Um, was there anything that the panel would like to add or before we? I've yes, put in... I, I would, if okay. you don't mind. Well, Barbara and <laughs> I, I want to go back. I want to go back to um, what I was talking about when I mentioned some of the the um, the um, kids that we've given scholarships to, and I couldn't think of the name of the movie. And the name of the movie that won an Oscar and he did the music score for was, uh, the movie was Green Book. You guys remember that? Anyway, so that's one of ours. And I have to say that with Christopher, we carried Christopher for a long time. We sent him to Juilliard twice and, um, and he never failed to give back to the community. And I have to give him kudos for that. And he has gone on and done wonderful things. And the league has also decided what we're gonna do is we have done is to give scholarships to um, disadvantage. So we're giving scholarships to disadvantaged students as well. And right now we have one student that we've carried ever since he was 15 years old that has, um, uh, He's autistic and he plays the saxophone, the trumpet. And we have carried him for, for years. Right now he's attending Morehouse. He's doing wonderful work. So at the end we have, you know, like showcased him on several occasions. And most of our kids that we have given scholarships to, I have to say, Susan, they have really not disappointed us. And we, you know, our selection process is very lengthy and very, very um, hard. The yeah, the quality not, of the and the, the and the quality of the kids that we're getting is is incredible. Is, it, it is incredible. And I'm going to ask Dorothy Lazard before I close out the program, Dorothy, to please. Uh, you are going to make a statement. Oh, I just, uh, well, I have lots of questions, but one thing I, I wanted to share with your audience is I've put in the chat a link for those of you who are interested uh, to learn more about Delilah Beasley. I have put in the chat the link to uh, inter uh, kind of lengthy interview I did. Maybe it was early this year. Maybe it was last year. Who knows? Because, you know, COVID. Um, but I, I would say a few months ago where we talk about Delilah Beasley and include her involvement in various women's uh, clubs in Oakland. It's specifically about Delilah Beasley's career as a journalist, but also as a historian. So I Sorry. wanted to just make sure people knew that that was in the chat. Sounds wonderful. You know, I know that there are more questions and that our panelists have more to say but it is time for us to wrap up this program. We hope to do more exploration of this, of this topic. Um, but for now, I wanna thank everyone who tuned in and joined us in the audience. Uh, effusive, grateful things to our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much. And would everybody please join me in thanking our guests for this discussion about the history of black women's clubs in California. It will be posted on Cam's YouTube channel so to, to send your friends to watch. So we're gonna say thank you everybody and good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>